Perhaps the most important game for Magnus Carlsen to show that he has fully arrived in Moscow for the World Rapid and Blitz Chess Championship was this victory from day two over Vietnamese Grandmaster Le Quang Liem. No stranger to winning these Rapid and Blitz events, Le Quang Liem is a former World Blitz champion if he didn't get that memo. Uh, but in this game, it was all Magnus Carlsen all day. Magnus, 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 Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Must have been how Jan, I mean Le Quang Liem, felt after this game. Let's dive in and see how Stella, a.k.a. Magnus Carlsen, got his groove on there in Moscow. Starts out with d4. Now, I highlighted in his victory over Lesnika the very flexible, very blitz, rapid kind of system with knight f3. The London stuff is good for a lot of practical reasons. You can really dictate the preparation. But we see Magnus really was feeling it and ready to play for some of the sharpest stuff against the Quang Liam. Not going to go for the practical but not very deep London system. Instead, he's going to play the Queen's Gambit and go right for some of the sharpest lines in the Queen's Gambit, accepted with DC4 and E4. Uh, now, this stuff has been played, obviously, for a long time. I don't need to overanalyze and, and give you tips about this particular position, but the main principle takeaway is that after D takes E4, obviously, Black has sacrificed control over the center, and with D4 and E4, White is aggressively, in the most possible direct fashion, grabbing control. Of course, you also immediately prepare to win back the pawn, but the thing with E4 is that it allows Knight F6, rather than, uh, for example, slower approaches like Knight F3 and Knight C3, that's what I'm saying, instead of E4. Excuse me, apparently I can't highlight Knight F3 and uh, Knight C3. Uh, but after E4, Knight F6, you have to go in for the variations we see Magnus do with E5. The reason is that now it's a little bit too late to take the slow, let me defend my setter approach because of a very common trick that everybody should take note of if you don't know these positions as black or white. The trick here for black is E5, sacrificing the pawn on the center square because after queen takes d1 either white takes with the knight and loses the e4 pawn or you take with the king and the move knight g4 comes in which is a fork to f2 and e5 and black is actually already almost clearly better in a lot of these middle games slash end games if you consider it such without the queen so this is a very important sort of positional tactic to make yourself aware of in any queen's gambit accepted and it's why when we see magnus play the most aggressive line with e4 and knight f6 comes you know he's going to play e5 that's the only other real way to defend the pawn besides knight c3 which as i said allows the e5 trick so, e5 is played after knight to d5, bishop takes c4. The, the thing about this position structurally is you say, well, white has gotten the big center. That's the whole idea of the queen's gambit accepted. But you've given up the outpost square on d5. That's a square that can no longer be attacked by any white pawns because the c pawn is gone and the e pawn has been overextended. But what you get in terms of the tempi with your development, and if you're preparing it deeply, as we know Magnus did here, then white can still get very, very sharp positions. After knight to b6, bishop b3 were in theory, bishop f5, knight f3, e6. These moves all very, very logical, very natural, both sides just developing. Bishop e3, bishop e7, Rekarovka for both players, and now the move a3. Now, uh, in uh, Calcutta, the Tata Steel Rapid and Blitz, not more than about 60, not even, I guess about a month ago, uh, Dingley Ren played the move h3 against Mantala Hare Krishna. That game went queen d7, now a3. And after rook a d8, queen e2, king h8, rook f d1, bishop g6, rook a c1, bishop h5, and after g4, bishop g6, we reach the relatively complex middle game position that Dingley Ren and Hare Krishna had. Uh, I would say that white is still a little bit better here, uh, may, maybe clearly better depending on the right plan, but I like the way Magnus played it better. So again, h3 played here on move 11 by Dingley Ren. Magnus played the move a3. I think the reason is that a3, stopping usage of the b4 square, that's the main point of it, right? You're stopping this knight from coming to b4, which might fill the d5 square. Again, apparently I can't highlight. That square becomes an outpost, and it's one that blockades the d-pawn, kind of keeps white pieces passive. So a3 is flexible on the queen side. It stops this knight before plan. And after the move knight a5, we see that Magnus plays bishop c2 and has a little bit more aggressive intentions on the king side than the, than the approach that Ding Li Ren took with h3, even though it had g4. Now, in this position, we get our first critical mistake. Perhaps the only one the Quang Liam was going to be afforded in this game because Magnus was in uh, such good form. He played the move queen to d7, which is a novelty, but not a good one. Bishop takes c2 is the only move that had been played before here, and it makes more sense to trade. Play knight a to c4. 
And after knight e4, rook c8, knight fg5, white does go for a bit of an attack on the king side to induce the weakness of g6. After takes, takes, and queen d5, we have a position where white's a little bit better. Uh, the, the double pawns in the center are more helpful than not, right? They support kind of the inchworm here to ultimately help expose the dark squares. Uh, but black has c5 coming, and if you can get c5, start to liberate both the rook and the bishop and open up the queen side, black's going to be okay. So this is much more of the type of position that probably the Kuang Liam would have wanted in hindsight. He tried to get tricky here with the move queen to d7. But Magnus plays bishop takes f5, e takes f5, and then immediately says, I think you're breaking basic principles here. I'll go ahead and grab that center, the one that I got as early as move 3 when you played d takes c4 in the queen's gambit accepted, and I'm not going to look back. What I really like about this game is actually the next move, though. If you pause and think about how to deal with the position... I think that this is the move that Laquan Liam underestimated because it's so very counterintuitive. When you look at this position, the knight comes to c4. It's threatening both b2 and e3. You really start to think of how can I hold and save my bishop? Usually such an important piece compared to a knight. The bishop is better. The bishop will be more active as, as the positions become open, right? We tend to favor our bishops. So you start calculating ways to do that and even consider moves like bishop c1 but then something like rook to d8 comes, and this center that you grab may actually be overextended. Uh, and so in this position, I love the move Magnus played because it, it kind of surprised me. As simple as it seems, it's counterintuitive, but clearly the best move once you see it. He plays bishop takes b6, just parts ways with the supposed to be better minor piece. And after knight takes queen to b3, he's just bringing the rooks to the center and saying, I have a huge pawn formation that you can't undermine, and I'm going to use it. After g6, he plays h4, a move that kind of dual purpose, frees the back rank if you're really into, into that long-term thinking, prepares moves like h5, good stuff. He does indeed play h5, and after bishop c5, queen c2, a5, queen c1, threatening h6 check, as well as bringing the queen over to this side of the board, perhaps things like h6 and queen g5, followed by, I don't know, mate on the dark squares. Laquang Liam plays queen e7 to stop those ideas, but the queen comes over here anyway. And after knight d7, I'll give you a chance to pause the video just as I did in the previous review of his, meaning Magnus Carlsen's victory over Czech Republic Grandmaster Victor Lesnica. Let's find that knockout blow here and let's be accurate with our calculation. Try to play like the Norwegian World Chess Champion. If you haven't paused the video, I'm going to continue. Place the move b4. Exclaim of Iach. Give respect to the, uh, the, to the move before. The main point is that after A takes, you can't take again with the bishop because D6 just wins a piece. You're cutting off the communication between the queen and the minor. Because of that, the piece has to back up. And as soon as it does, you're leaving the critical areas of the board. H6 check, king G8. Now comes D6 again. You don't have the bishop here defending it. After queen F8, this is really the fun move. E6. Nothing like looking at two hanging pawns on the sixth rank, but your opponent hardly has time to take any of them, right? If you take the E pawn, I take C7. If you take the D pawn, I take D7. You're running out of time. E6 again, if we want to do a little sports center instant replay. A pretty sexy move to open up the queen's protection of the C7 square, uh, as well as just advance both these pawns. Huge heavyweight punch there. F takes E6. D takes E7. Rook C8. The piece falls, and with it, the rest of the game. We get a trade in knight d5. Of course, Laquang Liam probably could have resigned the moment his knight hung on d7. But uh, again, just final combination here. The game is over. Everything is falling. b6, f6. I don't even know what move to recommend here because I don't think you can move the queen and guard the bishop. But even if you could, there's probably mates on the dark square. So uh, Magnus Carlsen really finds himself here in this victory over Laquang Liam. Puts himself in a fantastic position to win the World Rapid Chess Championship. We know he likes having World Chess Championship titles. Uh, and uh, this is one that he's had before and, and wants to get again. So I uh, hope you enjoyed these two videos. Give us a like. Give us a subscribe. We'll uh, see you around on chess.com. And uh, more World Rapid and Blitz coverage coming at you live. We've got Yasser Sirwan and Robert Hess doing it daily over at chess.com TV and twitch.tv slash chess. So check it out and uh, see you around.